This is Vic Carrero with The Glass Darkly, and in this video we will look at the historical evidence for Jesus' self-understanding as the Messiah of Israel. Everyone has an opinion about Jesus. Some are well-researched opinions based on the available evidence, some are wild speculations with no historical grounding whatsoever, like the classic alien Jesus. It's been pointed out that many portraits of Jesus painted by historians over the years turn out by a fascinating coincidence to be pale reflections of the historian's own ideological outlook, a Jesus made in their own image. It's been argued with great rigor that Jesus was a socialist, a cynic sage, a political zealot, and just a good old religious moral teacher who unfortunately got himself crucified, but his influence lives on. The common thread through all these diverse portraits of Jesus is that they are void of any supernatural character. He was just a man. Christians, on the other hand, have claimed that he is much more than a man. He is the unique messianic son of God who inaugurated his kingdom on earth and redeemed the world through his death on the cross. So who's to say? Well, in his famous book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis made the following statement, which has since been famously referred to as the trilemma. He states, I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I am ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else he is a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Liar, lunatic, or lord. Or in other words, he was either evil, crazy, or the son of God. A mere good moral teacher would never make the self-aggrandizing claims that Jesus made, and thus we are left between embracing one of the three horns of this trilemma. But over the past couple of centuries, critics have claimed that they need not choose between these three options at all. He wasn't a liar, he wasn't a lunatic, but he also wasn't Lord. He was a legend. He never said any of the things that the writers of the Gospels said he said. He never claimed to be the Messiah, he never claimed to be the Son of God. This theologically rich understanding of Jesus was a later invention of the writers of the Gospels and the Christian communities they represented. As the story of Jesus was told and retold throughout the years, it suffered from a large degree of legendary embellishment. And these lofty theological portraits were projected backwards and self-attributed titles were placed onto the lips of Jesus, even though he never actually made such claims himself. The traditional Jesus we read about in the Gospels, critics contend, is not an accurate picture of the historical Jesus, but rather a product of Christological reflection shaped by later Greek-speaking Christians. The Gospels describe the Christ of faith, not the Jesus of history. Well, the first question we should be asking is this, how did Jesus understand himself? We know that the earliest followers of Jesus thought of him as the Messiah, if only for the reason that the title had come to be inseparable from his name. The very word Christ, or Christos, is the Greek translation of anointed one, or Messiah. In the opening words to his gospel, Mark states, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And John, in a similar fashion, concludes his gospel by stating that these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. But it's claimed by critics that Jesus never understood himself to be the Messiah or the Son of God. These were later Christian inventions, not authentic portraits of the historical figure. But if it can be shown that Jesus did have this radical self-understanding, then it seems that C.S. Lewis's trilemma does hold and we are once again faced with the threefold choice to make between liar, lunatic, and lord. So with the use of the historical method summarized in the previous video, we will proceed to examine the sources contained in the New Testament not as a theologian reads an inspired religious text, but as a historian examines ancient biographical documents. It is my contention that Jesus did indeed understand himself to be the Messiah of Israel and the unique Son of God, and that this can be shown through assessing the historical evidence. In this video, we'll look at that first title, Messiah. So what is the Messiah? The Messiah of Israel was the central figure of expectation who would be appointed to accomplish a redemptive role toward God's people. And we may wonder why the earliest followers of Jesus arrived at the common conviction that Jesus was the Messiah of Israel. William Lane Craig makes the following statement. 
Unless Jesus himself made messianic pretensions, it's difficult to explain the unanimous widespread conviction that Jesus was the Messiah. Why, in the absence of any messianic claim on Jesus' part, would Jesus' followers come to think of him as the Messiah at all, and why was there no non-messianic form of the Jesus movement? And it's a good question. Let's look at some textual evidence then for the messianic self-understanding of Jesus. In Mark chapter 8, we read the story of Peter's confession. I'll read it in its entirety. Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Who do people say that I am? They told him, saying, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but others one of the prophets. And he continued by questioning them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. And he warned them to tell no one about him. Many critical scholars have contended that this passage is a retrojection of the church's later beliefs, an entirely fictive story meant to elevate Peter as the one who stood up and declared Jesus to be the Christ, the Messiah. But the authenticity of this passage is evidenced by the very next verses, which accomplish the very opposite of what the critics claim. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. As soon as Jesus explains to the disciples what his role as the Messiah entails, Peter objects to Jesus and rebuked him. Jesus responds by calling Peter Satan. This is a classic example of the criterion of embarrassment. Peter was a highly regarded figure in the early Christian church, so if it was the intention of the writer to elevate Peter in this story, it would hardly be productive to call him Satan moments after his confession of Jesus as the Messiah. This awkward and embarrassing detail within the story suggests its historical credibility. Secondly, a Peter who confessed Jesus as the Messiah receives independent attestation from John 6:69, 6, where Peter says to Jesus that we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And third, the story satisfies the criterion of historical coherence. The New Testament scholar Michael J. Wilkins makes the following observation. The evangelists' accounts of Peter's declaration demonstrate authenticity because the incident has coherence historically with both the developing messianic ministry of Jesus and the final events of Jesus' life that led to his crucifixion. Here we employ the criterion of historical coherence, which looks at the larger pattern of Jesus' historical circumstances and the principal features of his life. This criterion looks to one of the most striking things about Jesus' earthly life, his violent death, and attempts to understand the whole of his life in the light of that final event. As Meyer states, a Jesus whose words and activities did not threaten or alienate people, especially powerful people, is not the historical Jesus. And so we have good reason to think that this passage in Mark is an authentic portrayal of Jesus' self-understanding as the Messiah. Jesus affirmed Peter's confession that he was the Christ. Let's look at another text, this time not what Jesus said, but perhaps more convincingly what he did. This brings us to Mark chapter 11, where we read of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem during the last week of his life. This was the climactic public demonstration of his kingship to an onlooking crowd. To those unfamiliar with the story, one week before his death, Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey to celebrate the Passover feast as the crowds hail him and shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So is this story historical, and if so, how does it furnish belief in Jesus' self-understanding as the Messiah? First, the story is independently attested by both Mark and John, and although the circumstantial details differ, the nucleus of the story is in agreement. In fact, the variation of subsidiary details suggests independent sources were used by both authors. So we've satisfied the criterion of multiple attestation. Now it may be asked in what way does Jesus' entry into Jerusalem in this manner support his messianic status? He rode upon a donkey of all animals. Doesn't seem to be a fitting beast to match the occasion. Well, it turns out that there is a reason why he chose a donkey. In doing so, he was deliberately fulfilling the messianic prophecy of Zechariah 9, verses 9 through 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the bow of war will be cut off. And he will speak peace to the nations, and his dominion will be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. In riding upon a donkey into Jerusalem, Jesus is provocatively claiming to be the one described by Zechariah. He's acting out his role as the coming king and inviting everyone to receive him as such. So Jesus affirmed Peter's messianic confession, and he self-fulfilled the messianic prophecy in Zechariah chapter 9. 
And lastly, Jesus' messianic self-understanding is evidenced by the inscription on the titulus placed above his head when he was crucified, which read, The King of the Jews. The inscription of these words is, according to the New Testament scholar Craig Evans, a tradition that most scholars are prepared to accept as genuine. Considering that the title King of the Jews was never a Christian title for Jesus, we have, by virtue of the criterion of dissimilarity, good reason to agree with the majority of scholars. We may ask then, why were these words inscribed and not some other words? Something had to cause Pilate to write these words and inflict the most extreme of penalties upon Jesus. If Jesus were a mere troublemaker stirring up the crowds like many who had come before him and after him, then it seems incomprehensible that Jesus would be crucified as the King of the Jews. This would hardly be fitting with what we know about Roman execution. He had to have been guilty of something far greater. As Craig Evans states, because the religious authorities recognized the importance of the wording of the inscription placed on, above, or in the vicinity of Jesus' cross, they most likely handed Jesus over to Pilate not simply because he criticized and perhaps threatened them, but because he acknowledged that he was Israel's Messiah, the king of the kingdom that he had proclaimed throughout his ministry. This the Romans would interpret as being treasonous. So with those three lines of evidence, I think we have good reason to believe that Jesus understood himself as the expected Messiah of Israel, even if that understanding was interpreted somewhat differently than his contemporaries. He would not be a political Messiah to smash his enemies and rule all nations by force, but he would be a humble servant to suffer for the sins of his people and only then return as a glorious king. But Christians believe that he is more than just the Messiah. We believe that he is the Son of God. In the next video, we will examine the historical evidence for this exalted title before finally turning to the subject of his resurrection. Stay tuned.